closed sets, sequences, um, uh, connected sets, compact sets. Okay. So it's like a crash, crash course in, uh, in analysis. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, the definition. We're not going to we're not going to use any uh, complicated uh, definition of, of closed, but rather just say that the set um, F is called closed if a complement uh, is open. Right, so a complement um, over here. A complement, of course, is the set of points that um, are not in F. You are you are closed if your if your complement is, is open, okay. And as you uh, just seen, uh, it's possible that you could be closed and open at the same time. Such sets are called closed. Okay. But I actually I, I've never heard this term used by anybody except. Uh, uh, okay. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. So. Um, <laughs> Right. Um, so there's an analogous proposition uh, about closed sets and set operations. Um, so one, as you might expect, uh, the intersection of any collection of closed sets is still closed. And then two, mm -hmm. you know, analogously, the union of any finite collection of closed sets is closed. Okay. Um, and another uh, analogous statement um, that is proved using using the um, using the the, the, the last uh, theorem that was mentioned um, is that. Uh, you have a function from C to C. Um, F is continuous if and only if um, the inverse image of any closed set is closed. Okay, so. You close the set in C, you pull it backwards, and uh, the inverse image is also closed if, uh, if, the, if the function is continuous. Okay. So that is the, the analog of the, of the theorem that was stated at the beginning of, uh, stated at the end of the last class that um, um, uh, F is continuous if and only if. Um, F inverse E is open for all open sets. Okay. And um, let's uh, did did it did you all look at this? Did you all take a look at the proof of this? I hope. Um, let's uh, let's see if, if, if somebody can, can tell us about it. Um, can somebody tell us the, which uh, um, which direction would you like? They both. Which what what direction do people like? F continuous implies F inverse C is open, or uh, F inverse C is always open for open sets, or F inverse C yeah, or the reverse. Which do you like? This way. Or not? Does anyone have a preference? The reverse. Let's go backwards. Why not? Okay. So. Um, uh, right. So, can anyone? Is anyone? Does anyone? Is anyone able to come up here and and, and explain that? Anyone able to do it? Let's think of what you have to do. Right. We want to show that uh, given e open and c uh, I've never seen. That is any point in F inverse C, right, 
any point in that finger scene uh, must be interior is interior to that finger scene. Right? In other words, given any point in F inverse C, there's a ball around it that's contained in F inverse C. So, right, right, here's some A, some A, F, right, and you look at the set F inverse C, <coughs> right, and you have some point. You want to show that if you take any point here, then there's a ball around it, any point here P, then there's a ball around it that is contained entirely in F inverse E. In other words, um, in other words, for any point in F inverse, F, F inverse E, um, e, there exists a neighborhood, uh, there exists a neighborhood around P um, such that that neighborhood Contained in it. Right? So, uh, how do you know that there's going to be some neighborhood around here that's, that's mapped entirely inside of E? Let's say here's F of P. Right? P is there, so F of P is here. Right? P, is in, F, P is, in the, is in the pre image of E, so F of P is in here. And how are you going to find how you want to show that there's a, there's a neighborhood around P that is contained in E? Okay, I'll let you think about it. Okay. Try, try and, uh, um, if you understand, right, what, you have only one fact to use that. Um, oh, wait, what am I doing? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> I'm going forwards. Yeah, you should actually stop me. I'm, uh, yeah, this is not what we want to show, right? <laughs> right? Sorry, sorry, I was going crazy. Why? Uh, okay, anyway, let's go this direction since I've already started this, on this direction. Okay. Um, yeah. So we want to show that uh, if the function is continuous, then given any open set here, f inverse is going to be open. Maybe that's why that's why you all are kind of confused. Or there could be another explanation. So uh, yeah, think about it for a couple minutes. Think about it for, for a minute by by yourself, and then and then I'll have you guys talk to each other. Turn to somebody nearby and, and say, "Here's what I think. Of it. Here's, here's my idea. We're going to use continuity." <coughs> blah, 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 blah. Okay. Okay. So, so, so. 
Yeah. 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 Okay, so who would like to explain it? Who would like to explain what they're, explain how to do it? You're looking for, right, you want to show that given any point in F inverse E, then there's a ball around it that gets wrapped inside of, wrapped inside, entirely side of E. So how do you, how do you do it? You have only one, one fact about F. It's continuous, right? Remember what continuous means? Continuous means, right, that we can, um, we can make the outputs as close to, as close to F as we want. Uh, as close to F of P as we want. Right? So, so how close do we want to make it? Arbitrarily close. Well, not arbitrarily close, but a certain uh, a question. So, um, you know that since uh, f of p is interior to e, that yeah. there exists some. Um, is open, right? So, yeah. so, so there's some epsilon ball. There's a ball around p. f of p. That's the same as e. And then, uh, since you know f is continuous, you know that um, for a given neighborhood around f of p. Uh, around p. Or yeah, so a delta, there exists a delta neighborhood around P such that F of that neighborhood is entirely in the epsilon ball in the P. Yeah. So take a look at it, right? You say, well, right, we're looking for we're looking for a ball around P. So we're looking we're looking for a ball around P that gets mapped entirely inside of E. That's that's you know, that's what we've reduced our problem to. We, we take, you take some point P, we're looking for a ball around here that gets mapped entirely in here. Well, F of P lies in, in E, and E was open. E being open means that F of P is interior, right? So it's, there's some epsilon ball around here that's in t that, that is contained in E, right? Well, let's take that epsilon ball and use the continuity of F, right? Continuity of F means that we can find a delta ball, we can find a delta ball around here, that gets mapped ins entirely inside of this epsilon ball. Right? That's what continuity means. Right? Given any epsilon ball here, we can find a delta ball around, around P that gets mapped inside there. So, that, so, that, that's the, so we found it. We found, it, we found a ball around, around P whose output lies entirely inside of e, the end. Right? That's, we found, we found a um, neighborhood of P that lies inside of F inverse E, and thus F inverse E is an open set. Right? For every point P, we were able to find a neighborhood of it that lies inside the set. So F inverse E is an open set. That's, remember, that's what we need to do to show something open. That we need to show that every point is interior. We've just shown that for an arbitrary P, that P is, is interior. Okay. Any questions? Michael, you have, is it all right? No, that's good. Okay, good. Valerie, how about you?
Um, you know, actually, before we go on, let me uh, stop for a second and say that I'd ask the, um, let me step up of the lectern for a second and say, I've asked the graders to hold um, you know, uh, like a tutoring session. Um, I think that's, I know that you do that in, in, in the other colleges. We don't often do that at Scripps, but I think it's a good, good practice. Um, so I've asked them uh, to maybe do it on, on Wednesdays. Um, since the, since the assignments I do on, on Thursdays, I, I thought maybe Wednesdays would be good. But um, uh, um, so, um, uh, does that does that make sense to people, or, or does, is that is that not a good day, or is that um, that is does is that a sensible day first? Okay. Now, um, now does it actually work? Um, so. Uh, I'm not sure when all the graders are available, but one of them is only available, um, I think, after five or so. Um, uh, and then the other one uh, hasn't really, hasn't responded yet. Um, but let me just let me just put up some times and and see what happens. So uh, so three three to four four to this one is four to five three to four four to five five to six. So, um, <clears throat> how, uh, how many of you could, uh, can make three to four? Only two. Okay. How many of you can make four to five? Uh, so, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Okay. Three, six, eight. Okay. There, there are ten of you. Okay. Uh, five to six? There, there is a naming game that we that I often play in sort of lower level classes. I'm not going to make you guys play the naming game, which involves a newspaper bat and people being hit. Um, but uh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's only in lower level classes. Okay. What? Why is it only in lower level classes? So I feel like you guys are too old for that. You're too grown up for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sequences, uh, same thing in, in, in uh, complex numbers. You also talk about sequences. And it's basically the same, 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 uh, same ideas. Okay. So let z sub n be a sequence uh, of complex numbers. Okay. Um, let z naught also 
be some point, uh, some complex number. Um, <coughs> uh, so if given any, again, given any epsilon, there exists an n, there exists a natural number n, such that um, c minus c naught is less than epsilon for all n bigger than n. Then we say z naught, that's like zn, converges to z naught. Can rephrase this, of course, by saying in terms of neighborhoods, yeah, right? If given any neighborhood of C naught, there exists an M such that um, Z M uh, is contained in the neighborhood for all and bigger than M. There's a time past which everyone with is, is within epsilon of z naught. There's a time, uh, you know, given any neighborhood, <coughs> there's a time past which all the points lie in that neighborhood. Okay. So the picture is like this. You have some z naught, and you have some points, and they are converging to this thing. What that means is that um, Given any epsilon, given any epsilon neighborhood, you choose any neighborhood of C naught. There's going to be some time past which all the points lie inside, all the points lie inside that epsilon. Right? And you know that's you can do that for any for any epsilon. Right? Somebody says, uh, uh, can you ensure that all all points? Can you ensure that your points are going to lie within <coughs> point one of Z naught? You say, yeah, you know. Past you know the the you know past past n equals a billion you know all the guys lie inside there you can find you can find some time past which all the points satisfy the the constraint that you're given. so that's what that's what converge, convergence of the sequence means um, and you write uh, z z n converges to z naught <coughs> or sometimes or you can write the limit of z n equals z naught goes to infinity. Um, it will turn out, uh, here we're just going to do this fact. Um, uh, sequences of complex numbers, Zn, so again, Zn is sequence in C. Um, Zn converges. If and only if uh, Zn is what's called a Cauchy sequence. Okay. And the definition of Cauchy sequence is the following. Um, we say Zn is Cauchy. We say Cauchy sequence. Uh, if given any epsilon, there exists a time such that um, the distance between Zn and Zm is smaller than epsilon for all n and, and bigger than bigger than. Yeah. Just a, a, a semantic question. Yeah. Would, would you say a sequence is a subset? Oh, well, yeah. Is yeah. that like short? I'm asking, like, is that a shorthand, or is it is it a subset? It's a shorthand, I'd say. So I mean, we're not. This isn't really a isn't really a set, right? It's an ordered set, right? But but 
if I write this, what I mean is it's a, you, know, you have a sequence that lies, a sequence of complex numbers. Right. Okay. So, let's see be a uh, sequence of complex numbers. <coughs> yeah, so you're right. It's, it's a little bit fishy for me to, to write that. Yeah. Hey, Michael. How, is, how, how do we order the complex numbers? No, no, no. This is this is just an ordered set of you know it's a it's a set of um, of things that have an order z one z two z three z four. That's all I can put that. Not, 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 not. Okay. So this will be this will this uh, will be a u useful fact for us. Um, uh, this, we we might we might need to use this fact that um, when we're talking about convergence. Uh, you know, in, in the complex numbers, convergence is actually equivalent to this other this other statement being Cauchy. Okay. Um, uh, so um, uh, Cauchy, you see that in the definition of Cauchy, um, you can know that something converges without knowing what it converges to. Right. You don't need to know what it can. It's you don't. It, there's nothing in the statement of Cauchy is talking about talking about the, the point z naught over there, right? Um, what you check rather is that given any given any number, there's a time past which all guys past that time are are within that number of each other. Okay, so all those things are close to each other. Okay, and this will guarantee um, in, in 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 the real numbers and the complex numbers. It turns out that being convergent is equivalent to being Cauchy. That's uh, that's a deep that's a deep fact. So we're not we're not going to prove that. Okay, this is what's um, uh, <coughs> abbreviated as C is complete. When one says something is complete, one means that convergent sequences are Cauchy sequences. Is it sequences or is it the space the space numbers? No, wait, wait, wait. That's not really completely <laughs> Sorry. 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 That's not completely right. Um. Sorry. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh. Okay. So um, now we're going to rephrase some uh, some concepts. In terms of uh, in terms of sequences, okay. so first off, um, um, where f is a function on some set, um, f is continuous on A. If and only if, um, given any convergent sequence C sub n, n a, uh, the limit of f of c, uh, f of z sub n, as n goes to infinity, is So you can, you know, you can talk about um, uh, continuity in the way that we did before. You can also talk about it in terms of sequences, right? Uh, it's equivalent to saying that for any convergent sequence, you can uh, the limit of the function applied to the sequence is the function of the limit of the sequence. Okay, that is that you can commute. Uh, continuity basically means that you can pass the limit, <coughs> pass the limit through the function, right? I can pass the limit through here and just take the limit here first. Or I can pass the limit up, up through it. So continuity, that's basically how you want to think of continuity. You can, you can, commute, you can commute it with the limit. Okay. 
Um, so that is uh, the proof is an exercise uh, uh, in, in, the, in the homework section. Another proposition, um, closed, closedness in terms of uh, convergent sequences. Let F, B, and C, um, F is closed, if and only if, um, given any convergent sequence. Given any convergent sequence, given any convergent sequence of points in F, the limit of those points has to lie in F. Right? I mean, if, uh, so that's equivalent to the to the set being closed. Okay. Let me let me do at least part of the part of the proof. Um, so going forward, let's say that F is closed. And everything I'm going to say is, is in my notes, so you, know, you don't have to copy it if you don't want to. Um, uh, let's suppose that F is closed. Um, and uh, let's say that um, Z, Zn is, some, is a convergent sequence. And that uh, Zn converges to some point Z0. Okay. We're going to do this by, by contradiction. Suppose Z0 is not in F. Okay. Suppose Z0 is not in F, and we'll get a contradiction. Okay. Um, suppose Z0 is not in F, well then, of course, uh, Z0 is in a complement. Right. If complement is open, So Z0 is in F complement, which is open. Well, being since, since F complement is open, um, Z0 is going to be interior to it, right? So uh, which is open. So there exists a neighborhood of Z0 that's contained inside of, of F complement. Right? So, um, right, so here is is your set, your set F, and here's this point Z0, right? and your sequence converges, your sequence converges to Z0, Z0 lies in, in F complement. Right? Why, why does that give us a contradiction? Because then aren't there points um, in the sequence that are contained in the complement? Yes. Yeah. So we can get a neighborhood exactly. of Z0. Exactly, yeah. so you, you say, well, look, Z0 is interior, right? Z0 is interior, so there's some ball around it that's interior, that's in, in, in contained inside of, contained in a complement. But, you know, since these guys are convergent, past some time, they're all gonna lie inside this epsilon ball. And so that says that, you know, you know, almost all of our points lie outside of F, but we said that the sequence lay in F, so it's a contradiction. Um, uh, since Zn converges to Z to Z0, there exists an N such that uh, Z, uh, Z Zk lies in that neighborhood for all k bigger than N. Well, that's a contradiction. Right? Because supposedly the set uh, this thing was lay, lay in F. Seems like all of, almost all of them, all but finally many of them lie in uh, in F complement. Okay. Any any questions? Any questions? Yep. Good. Okay. Let's go do the 
opposite direction. Um, so, uh, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll leave the opposite, I'll leave the opposite direction for you guys to, to, to take a look at. So please uh, read it. It's not, it's not. No, I'll do it. Sorry, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very wishy washy. Um, okay, so let's see the opposite opposite direction. Suppose every convergent sequence um, in F converges with within F. So, um, so let's let's suppose that, um, and let's suppose uh, F is not closed. Suppose f is not closed. Right? In that case, a complement is not open. Well, being not open means that there's some point that's not interior. Right? Being open means all your points are interior. Being not open means that there exists some point z not in a complement that is not interior. Well, what does it mean that you're not interior? That there's no open set, there's no neighborhood of yours that lies inside of F complement, right? In other words, every neighborhood of yours intersects F, right? right. So that's to say, uh, an epsilon Z naught intersect F is non-empty uh, for all epsilon. Every neighborhood of every uh, every neighborhood of yours intersects F. Right. You are you are not interior, um, so every neighborhood of yours hits hits the hits the complement of the set you are in. Okay, so every neighborhood is Z naught, and I'm saying that every neighborhood has some point uh, of F in it, right? So that's what we're going to do: is take a <coughs> sequence of neighborhoods of radius radius one over n. Okay, and in each one, we're going to we're going to choose the point that lies in F. So um, let uh, right. So in particular, um, uh, for every n and one over n z naught uh, intersects f in some point. Call it z sub n. So we know that this this thing intersects. We know that if we look at one uh, radius one over one, that it intersects f at some point. If we look at the radius one over two, that intersects f. In some in some point which we call z two, one over three intersects some point intersects f at some point z three, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, what what have we done? We've created the sequence z sub n is a sequence of points in f that converge to z naught which lies in f complement, right? And that's a contradiction because we said uh, every convergent sequence in f uh, has a limit that lies in f, right? But we've just created a sequence of points in f that converge to something that lies outside of f. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, all we wanted, all you, you just need to find one sequence that converges, one sequence of points in F that converges to something that's not in F. We could have done it in some other way. You could have just chosen some other sequence, but this is this is one that, that works. This is one that 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 does it for us. 
So there's some, there's some choice involved there. So that's, that's what you need. So please read sounds. About the notion of relative open or relative closed. Um, let's talk about connected sets. We are not going to be very, very precise about connected sets. I've looked at notes um, from various other professors, you know, like somebody in, in, in Pomona and, and a friend of mine uh, in another college and who use the who use this text. And they both um, I think <coughs> they both do what I'm about to do, uh, which is we, we're just going to um, we're not going to get too much in the, into the into the details of the kind of process. So um, I'm just going to give you a bunch of conditions that are equivalent to con connect to the, to the set being connected. But let me tell you what connected means, uh, just so that you know. Um, so, uh, so definition, um, given a set in C, we let E bar uh, denote the intersection of all of all closed sets containing E. Okay. So you, you look at all closed sets containing that thing, you intersect them all, um, it's called the closure of e. you get this. You get this closed set, it's the smallest closed set containing your set smallest closed set containing your set. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you know, being at the intersection of all closed sets containing containing your set, it is the smallest closed set containing your set. Um, and it's called the closure. Second definition, um, let A and B be subsets of C. Um, if a intersect B closure um, is empty, and A closure intersect B is empty. Then we say A and B are separated. For, for uh, connected sets, um, we say a set is connected if it cannot be expressed as um, a union, a union B, of separated sets. definition of connected, but it's it's sort of hard to get your head around it. Um, and so instead, we're going to sort of give something that's a little bit more, more intuitive. Um, so definition, um, uh, let E be a subset of, again of C. Um, if given any points A and B in E, um, there exists a continuous curve gamma in E um, joining A to B. In other words, gamma zero is A, gamma one is B. 
uh, then we call the path connector. Okay, so you have this, you have this set, and any two points can be connected by some by some continuous curve. What? Uh, Sorry, this word curve. Something illegible. Joining continuous. A curve. Curve. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awful. What does it say? Yeah, because my R's look like B's, <laughs> and my U's look like N's. What was that? So basically, it just means that any two points can be connected by a curve. Okay, path connected. Any two points can be connected by some path. And um, uh, here is what's going to be great. What's going to be uh, what, how we're basically going to deal with all this stuff. Um, uh, in fact, path connected implies connected. And um, if B is open, then then connected implies path connected. Okay. And basically, for the whole course, we're only only going to be dealing with open connected sets, so it's equivalent to path connected. Okay, so that's. That's how we'll get around it. Um, path uh, connected and path connected will basically be the same thing for us. Two open two open balls mm -hmm. that are uh, that they're tangentially next to each other, right? So this point here is not in the set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's that's. Wait. Well, you couldn't. Hold on a second. So I don't I don't know offhand. I'll, I'll try to come up with an example for next time. Curve, um, your gamma can be chosen to be a differentiable function, not just continuous. And then the last thing that will be useful to us is that um, if f is continuous, 
then uh, sorry, if f is continuous and p is connected, then the image is also connected. Yes, sorry, I haven't, I haven't thought about it for a while. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So anyway, that's that's all we're going to say about about connected sets. Um, that's all we. This is what we're. You know, we'll basically consider them. Uh, we're only going to be considering open open connected sets, so they'll be all path connected. Okay. Um, last uh, last big idea: the notion of a contact set. So, um, uh, so contact sets you want to think of as basically something like a finite set. Okay, you have a finite set. You know, finite sets are easy to deal with. Um, compact sets are sort of um, you have an infinite set, but it has some qualities of finite of finiteness to it. Okay, so it's, it's sort of the infinite. It's the analog of a finite set among the infinite sets. Um, okay, so uh, here's how you define it. The, the definition is a little bit strange, um, but this is this is really the idea that turned out to be the right way to right way to define right way to define it. Um, so you start off with this uh, first first idea. So um, let k be a sub a subset. Let k be a set in C. Um, we say. Uh, A collection U sub alpha of open sets in C is called an open cover of K if K is contained in their union. So you, have, you just have some set, and an open cover is just a bunch of just a bunch of open sets that cover the set. So it's cover, an open cover of that set K. So now let's get the definition of, of compactness. Um, let K be, again, some subset, some set. If given any open cover, Um, there always exists. Um, so let's give some open cover use of alpha. There always exists a finite subcollection u alpha one, the u alpha n, say, um, that is still a cover of K. If that happens, then we say uh, K is compact. I've seen some people write this in this way, uh, like K sort of double double C. Um, but I don't I, I don't see it often. So being compact is this weird thing that whenever you have any cover of your set, you can always you can always find a finite subcollection of that cover that still covers your set. Okay. So clearly, if my point is if my set of k is finite, suppose this is k and the k is finite, then this is this is going to be compact, right? Because you know, somebody gives you an infinite cover, right? somebody gives you an infinite cover of it, and says, ha, huh, can you find a finite subcover? All you need to do is say, well, I'm going to just choose one guy to cover this guy, and one guy that covers this guy, one guy that covers this guy. 
Okay, and, and then you have, and then you have, you're going to have a finite subcut, right? If you're finite, then you know, then you can find a finite subcut. Okay, so you know, if you're finite, clearly you're compact, right? Because you know, no matter what cover you're given, you're always able to find some finite subcut. Okay. Um, but compactness, however, is sort of hard to hard to try to visualize. But there's a nice nice theorem. Um, Characterizing compactness in 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 C, um, the following are equivalent. This deviation. The following are equivalent. Okay. So K is compact. <coughs> K is closed and <coughs> bounded. K. Um, Every sequence of points in K has a convergent subsequence. Okay. So um, we're not going to prove it. These first two, the equivalents of the first two, are called they're called the Heinberg. This thing here is called sequential compactness. Okay. So compactness, we this will be this will be useful. Compactness being compact is equivalent to your set being closed and bounded, right? Bounded. Oh, we haven't defined it, but bounded means that you can find some finite ball that contains your set. There's some finite ball. Right? There exists um, some finite ball around the origin that contains a set. Right. It, can be, it doesn't need to be at the origin. It just some, any, there exists a finite ball that contains a set. Okay. And being compact, being compact is equivalent to this, this property that every sequence, uh, every sequence has a convergent subsequence. Okay. Right. So, for example, you know, if we look at our, <coughs> our, our finite set here, if we look at our finite set here, um, z1, z2, z3, uh, so that's a1, a2, Six, six, seven, right? Is it? Let's let's think about the last one. Every does every sequence of points. Suppose you have an infinite sequence of points in this set K. Are you guaranteed a, a convergent subsequence? Well, what what does that mean in this case? In the set in this setting of a finite set. So if it's infinite. Yeah. So thinking about this last thing. Right. Every sequence is going to have a convergent subsequence. Okay. Um, we said earlier that a finite set is, is compact. So does this finite set have that property that every sequence has a convergent subsequence? What does that mean? What do we mean by that? That's right. That's right. So if you have an infinite sequence, um, well, then for one of these values, it's going to have it's going to get hit infinitely many times. Right. So just choose the subsequence that keeps on hitting that same value, right? And that would give you your, your convergent subsequence, right? Because you have, the sequence is, has the same value throughout. Okay, right? You, you, right? Um, right? So you have some, if you have some infinite sequence, blah blah, right? Z, you know, each one of these is is you know uh, is one of these seven points, well then uh, it must be the case that one of these guys gets hit infinitely many, time, many, many times by the pigeonhole property, right? by the pigeonhole principle. So, um, so let's just say maybe A4 gets hit that many times, it's, it's the one that gets hit infinitely many times, so you just choose all the ones that hit A4 and that will give you convergent subsequence, right? because that subsequence is A4 constant. 
and we can get one more result, uh, one more important result in. Um, so f continues on k if <coughs> then uh, f of k is compact also. So the compact in the, the image, the continuous image of a compact site is, is still going to be compact. Okay. Who, who would like to, to prove it? Those of you who have seen it before, or who haven't seen it before. Fk is compact. Here it is. Here it is k. We map it through this continuous map guy. We get this thing over here. Fk. We'd like to show that given any open cover of this guy, Given any open cover of this guy, then we can choose a finite subcover. Go ahead, John. Could you just do the sequences just so you can pass the limit through because of the continuous So let me think of let me think what you're saying. So you're saying um, let's take uh, let z1 let z n be a sequence in FK, yeah. right? Then each of those guys comes from each of those guys comes from so Z N. Each of those guys comes from some uh, is F of is F of some A N, where A N is in A N is in K, right? And you can just choose a convergent. Choose a convergent subsequence there. And then, so then uh, there exists some subsequent A sub NK convergent in K, and they're going to converge to something in K because K is closed. Right? And so, yeah, that'll do. That'll do. So then um, F A and K, that's to say uh, Z and K, is convergent in FK. That'll do. That'll do. So that's one way. Um, uh, there's another. Um, let me give the way that I was that I was thinking. Do you, does anyone know some other way of showing it? Just directly from the definition of, of, of compactness. Um, what what you can do is the following. You say, well, um, let the alpha be an open cover. Then F inverse UA. If you take if you pull each of those open sets backwards, what, what do you get? Each of them is open. This is continuous, so you get open sets, right? So you get an open cover of K. Right? K is compact, so there exists a finite subcover. Then Go back forwards, and you can define its subcover. Okay. So this is a an open cover. Okay. Um, K is compact, so uh, K compact implies K is contained inside um, F inverse U alpha one. F inverse U alpha n. There's some finite subcover. Finite subcover. But then, k, then f of k is contained in, in is contained in U a one. So there's this finite subcover of yeah, I guess it's this finite subcover of f of a. But that was, that was good, uh, John, to, to do it in the other way as well. OK, so 
this is this is you know sort of a nice application of of using the topological definition of uh, uh, of, of continuity. Right? You have this you have this open cover here. You want to show that it has a finite set cover, right? Well, you have this infinite number of sets. You pull them all backwards to here. You pull them all backwards. They all open over here, so this being continuous pulls them backwards to open sets here that cover K. Right? They cover K, but K is compact, so we know there exists a finite subcover of them. And then so those those got that those finite guys cover K, and so the corresponding guys here will cover F of K. Because right? they covered K. So F of them will cover will cover F of K. And like essentially you're looking back at that open cover and then you're choosing the necessary sets to cover K, and then you reapply the function to those, those individuals. Exactly. And then those, they, you might transform them in a certain way, but they still cover them. That's right. That's right. That's right. They were open over here. You just, you just look, you just go back to the ones that, that, that the finite guys came from. OK. OK, that's it. Sorry to keep you, keep you up. I'll send out the, the assignment. Um, which will be all in 1.4 uh, later, uh, maybe tomorrow, I think. <laughs>